not only do I know a lot more about what happens in this show, but I am also really tired. And no, those two things couldn't possibly have anything to do with each other. You've seen a lot more episodes now last night, right? I am up to the storming of Central. Holy crap, what? Did I mention that I'm tired? So I'm probably going to be slurring what I say a lot. Well, I understand that you'd want to binge after this episode. This episode just raised so many questions. Honestly, what it was, it wasn't that this episode raised a lot of questions. It's that pretty much every single episode from here on out ends with a major cliffhanger. Re- major cliffhanger that is really good and really hooks you. The second reason that this ended up happening, I'm going to cut from the episode because I don't want it on the internet. So you're going to hear a beep now while I explain to Timothy the other reason why I did it. Welcome to Brotherhood, a spoiler-filled podcast where we review each episode of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. My name is Dylan MacArthur, the older brother. And my name is Timothy MacArthur, the taller brother. Today's episode, The Arrogant Palm of a Small Human. No funny jokes from us. That title is its own joke. So, I have a question for you, Tim. Did you take notes this time? Not very many, but I did take note. That's two for two. Okay, so this is the episode in which we get to see how, surprise, surprise, Maria Ross ain't dead, and how that all went down. We start off with Ed and Armstrong in Resin Bowl, making their way out to Xerxes. Before they actually get to Xerxes, we get a quick back in Central where there's Winry and Al. Jump cut to Xerxes, where they already are, and I've got a note about that. Wow, from Rizembul to Xerxes in less than three minutes? Those trains must be going at warp speed during those jump cuts. Uh, isn't Xerxes within Amestris? No, not really. Oh, oh, where is it then? It's it's basically near a border to Amestris. It's not actually in Amestris. This is the thing that the show starts to do, is that it's a bit like Dark Souls, in that once you've traveled that path, you don't have to actually travel it anymore. You can just sort of warp to where you want to go. That doesn't make any sense from the context of this show, but Dark Souls, yeah, I guess it makes sense in the context of Dark Souls. (laughs) But this isn't Dark Souls, so this is just ridiculous. But then again, they've also got... Only like 25 minutes to do everything, so whatevs. Speaking of Ling, he's still annoying. Yeah, he's still kind of annoying. I mean, he's not as annoying. This is nowhere near as bad as his first introduction. Oh yeah, he was... Oh my gosh. That was unbearable. Now we're just sort of dealing with a guy who's like, "Uh, Can you do something else that's interesting, please? Isn't the person like that, or we want him to be interesting? I want him to be interesting. Me too! <laughs> what What the crap? I realize that he's trying to play up the, oh, I'm just a innocent prince who has no idea what he's getting into. Why doesn't somebody else help me and save me while I take it easy? Anyways, on to the next subject. They go to Xerxes, where they find out that Sheen and Amestris have some similarities in their mythos. They both have some guy who shows up and teaches them stuff. And So here's the part where we get to backtrack and interview Dylan, who hasn't seen anything that comes after this episode and is just watching this for the first time. We're going to confer with his thoughts. Okay, hi, this is Dylan from the past. I've just watched that episode. And I think that... The guy who they talk about coming out of Xerxes looks suspiciously like father, but the guy who is supposed to be coming out of Xing doesn't 
really look like father except for that white robe thing so i'm wondering could that possibly be two different people are we dealing with multiple people who could possibly be you know really kind of dangerous and father-like i don't know this is going to be interesting to find out also i can't wait to find out what actually happened with that weird gate looking thing with the transmutation circle on the wall which is almost certainly a portal to another thing and that's all that i have to say i'm out peace Okay, this is Dylan in the future now. Back to talk about this Thank episode. Thank goodness for time traveling technology called knowledge of the past. I want to talk about uh, how they explained that Maria Ross was able to get taken out of the prison. There's still one thing that really bothers me about that. What's that? How did Mustang know Ross's teeth well enough to fool a mortician? <laughs> Uh um, maybe several morticians. I mean, we'll only see I don't know. Them. Let's ask Dylan from the past. Hey, Dylan from the past here. Roy Mustang, <laughs> knowing how to create a vaguely human-looking thing out of raw materials, is very interesting and suggests that he might know a little bit more about alchemy than he's letting on, or what we are even being let on at this point. I wonder if there is a bigger reason why he's a semi-candidate for a sacrifice. We'll get to that in the future, I assume. All right, back to you dylan in the future thank you dylan from the past so i can see you got tired of doing that <laughs> noise i like fancying dylan from the past as sort of the reporter on the field gathering information and not even really processing it just sort of throwing it through a time machine to dylan in the future being like here take this stuff put it into the podcast. The thing that I want to say about Maria Ross explaining how she was saved and snuck out of Central by Roy Mustang and his cronies. Number one, this is the first time that we're really getting to see Roy Mustang's team in action. And Dylan from the past, I know for a fact, kind of liked that and kind of wished that they could have gotten that started earlier. And kind of wish they could have gotten more screen time. I wish they got more screen time. Second thing, you'll remember from our last episode that I said, in order to pull that off, they had to have a really good reason for saving her. And that the way that they needed to save her had to somehow enlighten the bigger plot or else be exceptionally clever in a way that made us all go oh thank you like this made it all worth it i'm so glad that you toyed with my emotions and i think they kind of did that but not really no no they didn't i mean i'm glad that maria ross is alive because i like her character and i'm it glad that more Colonel... like they did it it doesn't sound like they did it to save her it sounds more like they're like well humans in danger and we need to Get the bad guys to come out. Let's kill two birds with one stone, shall we? It sounds like that was the only reason they were trying to save her. They needed something to set things in motion for the next several episodes. And they needed it to be, of course, big and dramatic. But I think that keeping us, the audience, out of the loop only served to throw us down an emotional path that we didn't need to be taken down because ultimately once we find out that oh all of this grieving that we're having to have for the loss of a character that we liked colonel mustang is for nothing it's just a they they pulled the wool over our eyes us gullible watchers and that's not fun <laughs> Oh, and we learn who killed Winry's parents in this episode. Yeah, that's one of the other big things. Ed is cornered by a bunch of Ishvalans while he's looking at the proto uh, transmutation circle. And they're all like, we're going to get you. And then he's like, don't get me. And then Granny shows up and she's like, don't get him. And they're like, OK. And then, and then she's like, by the way, Scar killed Winry's parents. And Ed's like, oh, crap. <laughs> And thus begins our Dickensian descent into finding out exactly how everyone in this show is related. Um, this is the thing that you won't have experienced because you've never read Charles Dickens, but this is one of the best parts of a Charles Dickens novel is finding out, oh, these characters who I thought had nothing to do with each other are actually intimately related because of this one event that took place many years ago that brings us all together, which is usually like some terrible tragedy. <sighs> Yes, exactly like Christmas. 
Also in this episode, Barry the Chopper gets to meet his body thing again. And then Barry's like, hmm, I'm not in my body anymore, so I can't feel pain from it. I'm going to chop it up. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> okay, Barry, you do you. <laughs> okay, Barry. That was my thought, too. <laughs> Riza is a talented florist and a sniper. Who'd have thunk it? <laughs> yeah, I like how they, I like how it turns out that all those calls that Mustang was making beforehand, turns out that they were all in code. Dylan from the past here saying, they totally got me. <laughs> I legitimately thought that he was having an affair. <laughs> I'm so glad that they're not. <laughs> they continue to get me throughout the rest of this series. Anything else that you want to say about this particular episode, Tim? The end of the episode, I think they did the cliffhanger real well. I really want to see the next episode. <laughs> I think that this show does a good job, better than most, of at the end of each episode asking the question, what is the worst possible thing that could happen right now? Oh, guess what? Let's Let do it. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that is, just throw it out the window. It's out for bat now. It's like, <laughs> oh, we could have our most beloved sniper get eaten by gluttony. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Yeah. Any rhyme or reason behind that? We'll figure that out later. Gluttony is terrifying. Mostly because you actually kind of feel sorry for gluttony sometimes. He, Yet I also want to kill him with fire. He is clearly, in terms of his mannerisms, meant to be based off of a dog slash small child going oh can i do it now please do i have permission dad can i do this yeah it actually makes him a lot more unnerving because at the same time every time he gets shot or whatever i feel sorry for him because of that he acts like a hamster has just bitten him he's like why'd they bite me that <laughs> hurt don't they know that that hurt me how insensitive of them. And at the same time, I also want to kill him with fire because he's freaking terrifying. <laughs> he eats people. Yeah. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> I kind of want that to be the end of the episode. <laughs> Let's have that be the end of the episode then. Goodbye. Bye.